Hello, and welcome to China Forum, the leading program for discussing the latest in trends and developments in Chinese culture, politics, and economics. My name is Grace Carroll, and I'll be your moderator for this program. Today, we are very glad to welcome two distinguished scholars to our program. First, I'd like to welcome Dr. David M. Lampton to our program. Dr. Lampton is Dean of Faculty and Director of the China Studies Program at Johns Hopkins University's School of Advanced International Studies. Specializing in China and Taiwan, Dr. Lampton has written extensively on U.S.-China relations and China's bureaucracy and foreign policy. He is a former president of the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations and a past director of China Policy Studies at the American Enterprise Institute. Um, second, I'd like to welcome Dr. Cheng Li. Dr. Li is currently director of research and senior fellow at the John L. Thornton China Center at the Brookings Institution. He is the principal editor of the Thornton Center Chinese Thinkers series and has also published extensively on China's political leadership, including his latest book, China's Changing Political Landscape, Prospects for Democracy. Dr. Li also serves as a director of the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations and is a member of the academic advisory team of the Congressional U.S.-China Working Group. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. So on today's program, uh, we'll be assessing the upcoming Chinese leadership transition in the fall of 2012, um, with the 18th National Congress of the Communist Party taking place at this time. Uh, as we know, seven out of the nine current standing committee mem members will be reaching retirement age in this coming transition. Uh, the anticipation of the large turnover to the fifth incoming generation of Chinese leadership has led to a great deal of speculation on how this uh, might affect party policy and leadership, as well as the r of the rippling effects that this may have on U.S.-China relations. So first, Dr. Li, um, I'd like to ask you to give our audience a brief overview of how often these transitions take place and what is the process that occurs when top leadership positions are handed off. Well, this is what the Chinese call the generational uh, transfer of power. Like elsewhere, generational tra transition of power does not occur that often. In China, or, or it only occurs three times in the PRC history. The first times, two times actually ended up sadly or tragically with the Cultural Revolution for the first and 1989 TMA for the second. The third transfer, generation transfer of power took place nine years ago in 2002 at the 16th Party Congress, which was remarkably peaceful, institutionalized, and orderly. Now, this upcoming one occurred in a very interesting time. Uh, at least the, the three things make this one particularly important. The first one is what you just mentioned, that the seven out of nine members of standing committee, this is the most powerful leadership body, the superior decision-making body, uh, uh, will, uh, the seven out of nine will be changed. And also the same pattern in the, state, the government, in the state council, seven out of eight people uh, highly likely will be replaced. In the military, the Central Military Commission, also seven out of uh, 10 members of uh, uh, military uh, uh, members of the Central Military Commission will be replaced. So that high level, that, that kind of percentage is uh, remarkable or unprecedented. Secondly, this is a time that uh, uh, the first time in the modern history China emerged as an economic superpower or like uh, even the number two most e important economy. So leadership change and also possible policy change will have a strong impact not only to China but also beyond the China's borders, particularly economic and social policy and also foreign policy. And uh, thirdly, this uh, leadership transition occurs at a time there's a lot of uh, change in Chinese society. There's a growing resentment uh, by various social groups, by middle class and the poor people. And there's also a serious concern about China's future, the direction, particular political direction, where China is heading. So these all three factors make the, this upcoming transition particularly important. And also in terms of process, let me add very quickly, this largely is still on the one hand, you select the first delegates to the committee, uh, to the Congress, about the 220, uh, 2,270 uh, 2, delegates. Then among these delegates, they select about the 350 
uh, uh, members or alternates of the Central Committee, then within these 350 members and alternates, they will uh, elect uh, uh, Parliament Bureau members and also uh, top nine, if it's still uh, nine. But in reality, it's largely decided by the outgoing Power Bureau and it's a standing committee. It's really the, the, the negotiation, compromise, deal making, very much uh, you know, uh, in the OPEC, although they introduced some election mechanism, but in the high level of leadership, particularly these uh, nine members standing committee and also 25 members also Power Bureau, largely decided by factional uh, compromise, deal making. So it's a very carefully selected process. That's right. Okay. I, th I think I would only ask, uh, uh, add, and I agree with uh, Chung Lee on everything he said, is that this is interesting, I think, in another respect. And that is, in, in effect, the previous two leaders of the Chinese Communist Party, that is the current one and Jiang Zemin, who preceded the current uh, president, general secretary, were in effect, uh, Deng Xiaoping played a major role in selecting them. And now we have a somewhat more I'll say open process, open in quotes, mm -hmm. uh, but you have a little more unpredictability in the process and a little more, I would say, genuine collective decision making. So there's the, 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 the way in which these names came to the surface represented a little more tugging and hauling and, and negotiation than uh, maybe in the past where Deng Xiaoping, uh, actually with respect to the current president, sort of exercised some influence from the grave. So I'd say this is sort of an indication of some degree of modernization in the selection process. Second thing I would say is this opens up strategies for now people more what you might call genuine political strategies. And you're beginning to see people, well, particularly the current a leader in Chongqing. This is a, a, a somewhat uh, distant city in China's southwest. And this person is trying to pursue a populist strategy in order to elevate himself onto the standing committee of the Politburo. So we may be seeing the development of political strategies in China's hinterland that allow uh, people that might not have been uh, uh, the first priority for the central uh, party apparatus to push their way on. I, I would just say one other thing, and this is not just a change in Beijing. This is a change in leadership in China's 30-some provinces and provincial level units. So you're actually talking about a transition of, that involves hundreds of major positions. Okay. All right. Yes. Um, actually, I wanted to come back to how public opinion and um, how public approval might be playing more of a role now than it would have in the previous transitions. Um, so we'll come back to that. But I was particularly interested in getting a take on some of the front runners who are expected to take up leadership positions in the in the coming transition. So for example, Xi Jinping or uh, Li Keqiang. Um, if, if uh, I guess first Dr. Lee, then and again Dr. Okay. Lampton, if you could just give us a sense of their backgrounds, their predispositions, and how their positions in the upcoming transition might affect China's policy, uh, both domestically and uh, towards the United States. And uh, Mr. Xi and uh, Mr. Li really represents uh, two factions mm -hmm. or two coalitions in Chinese politics. This is what I call one party, two coalitions to characterize Chinese elite politics. China is still one party state, but does not mean the ruling party, Chinese Communist Party, is a monolithic group with the same people, same kind of leaders, with back, same background, same view, same policies. Actually, they're quite different. And uh, sometimes uh, the differences become increasingly uh, known to the public. Now, Mr. Xi uh, comes from a very prominent family. His father was a vice premier. And uh, we call this kind of uh, leaders come from, uh, we call them princelings. They come from very prominent uh, uh, leadership family. So he represents the princeling group. And also to a broad extent, they represent the interests of the China's coast region. And like uh, uh, particularly Mr. Xi served as a leader, as a governor and the party secretary in three coast uh, uh, areas, uh, provinces level area in Fujian, Zhejiang, and uh, later Shanghai. And also that uh, he worked very uh, extensively in this uh, economic rich region, a very uh, 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 kind of pro-market and very market friendly, both domestically, but also with uh, foreign uh, 
uh, business group. He's a good friend of Hank Paulson and with some uh, other U.S. Uh, uh, business leaders. Now, uh, this can tell you a possible policy orientation that he may have on the economic front. Now, Mr. Lee comes from a very humble, relatively humble family background. And also, he advanced his career largely through the Chinese Communist Youth League, we call Tuan Pai. This is a new term to refer to leaders advanced their career from the Youth League, where Hu Jintao was in charge in the early 1980s. Now, he, uh, Li Keqiang was very much Hu Jintao's protege. And uh, 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 after he served as the top person in the Youth League, he also served as a, a, a governor and party secretary of Henan, and also in Liaoning as a party secretary. These are the, 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 the relatively inland region or the industrial and agricultural major provinces. Now, his hot button issue is about employment, about the social welfare, affordable housing, so it's a more uh, leaning towards kind of government, you know, the, the, the Hu Jintao's hot button issues like harmonious society and uh, try to reduce the gap between rich and poor, provide basic health care and etc. Now this is his orientation. He represents more the inland interests, particularly under him that the so-called rise of central China and rise of northeastern China become important uh, 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 policy objectives. So that these are the divides, and he represents a populist approach. But sometimes they cooperate, sometimes they compete for policy initiative. That make Chinese politics very, very interesting and very, very dynamic. I, I think I would only add is that I think um, that uh, you have uh, an interesting case with Xi Jinping. It's true he's been along the coast in China's most open areas. He's met mayors and leaders because they often go to Shanghai or to the provinces where he was. So he well, well knows the world and, and world leaders. I find interesting also he has limited military experience, unlike the current president who has had zero prior to assuming office. Uh, I don't want to exaggerate Xi Jinping's military experience, but he was a Mishu, uh, a secretary on the Central Military Commission, so he's certainly at least been exposed to the military upper stratosphere. His father, who I happen to know, um, is, was very much Deng Xiaoping's man to develop the open policy and the special economic zones. So if his son is anything like his father, mm -hmm. I find that uh, to be encouraging. With respect to Mr. Lee, I think it's everything that was said is true. But if one looks at Lee, uh, Lee Keqiang's past positions in Henan province, in Liaoning province, where he's had provincial level power, uh, his provinces haven't done all that well. So I think there's some debate uh, uh, about uh, the uh, past performance. It seems not to have hindered him greatly in the current circumstance, but I think there are some questions, and I think Lee has been a little more debatable for a promotion than I perceive she has been, although it looks like they both will move uh, forward. Now, I think just one other thing is, of course, we get fixated on the top two people. But actually, as I said, there are hundreds, if not thousands, involved in this shift. Uh, but if you look at even people that are likely to go on the Politburo or the Standing Committee of the Politburo, I'm struck by the young, dynamic, um, rather broad thinking people. I'm thinking, for instance, of the current uh, head of the organization department. Used to be the provincial first party secretary in Jiangsu. Uh, he's a very modern person, has a great exposure to the world. I think it's people we can work with. There, this, as also out in Sichuan province in, in Chongqing uh, city, uh, the, the uh, leader there, Bo Xilai, is a very modern person. It's true he's a princeling and so forth. But I find some of the people below the top two to actually be more interesting than the top two. This potentially could be a problem. Then you have two top two leaders and the line up for, uh, you know, to succeed Hu Jintao and uh, Wen Jiabao. And uh, sometimes uh, uh, you already see some criticism concerns uh, 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 regarding whether they are the really the, the leaders lead China for the next 10 years. But at the same time, the people just uh, immediately below them are notoriously ambitious. Mm. They mm. already engage unprecedented self-promotion campaign, like uh, mm. uh, 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 Mike just mentioned about uh, Bo Xilai in Chongqing, but he's not alone. And uh, Guang Yang, another power member in Guangdong, also doing a campaign 
and uh, trying to have a, a different set of policy vis-a-vis -vis Bo Xilai. But also recently in Shanghai, just uh, finished a party meeting, that also uh, Yu Zhengsheng, another heavyweight uh, a party group member, also looking for the promotion for the, uh, the nine-member standing committee, also have this um, a new policy initiative, talk about the trust. You know, which is very much needed yeah. in, in the country. So you can see the Chinese political system start to open. Now, this is a big challenge, whether the party can accommodate all these challenges and to lead to a, 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 a more open political system. And uh, hopefully, like Japan's LDP, you know, one still one party, but there's a legitimate factional fightings or, or competitions. But also, there's a real danger this is out of control. Not only leaders are divided, uh, sometimes uh, their, their disagreements become public domain, but also intellectuals. You look at the Be Beijing University and uh, some scholars pro one faction, some you know, really anti the other faction. And uh, the Chinese public you know, depends on their different interests, whether the poor people, middle class, different regions, they, uh, they may also have a say. So it's really a paradox of hope and fear. Hope that China can make a fundamental political transition to a better political institution uh, and uh, to accommodate uh, the, the rapidly changing society, represent different interest groups, and uh, through the mechanism, the inside the, 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 the political system, rather than a proper change. But the danger is the party may split along with the factional politics, really become out of control. So that's a very crucial moment. It's very much in the mind of these leaders, the retired leaders, current leader, and the future leader, and also very much in the mind of uh, uh, political elites in China. Okay, that actually brings up an interesting point that I, w I was curious about. Um, we talk about all these incoming leaders um, coming in with their different factions and potentially different interests, but how much um, influence do the retired leaders retain? Mm even after they are transitioned you want, you want out. Me to speak first? Well, <laughs> well, I'm glad that. Sure. I, well, I think it, it varies, but uh, let's put it this way. You asked about the public, and of course people in China retired at a relatively young age, and now you have a market economy, and you have a relatively open media, relatively open media, and people can earn incomes now on the speaking and writing circuits. And so you're finding a whole uh, generation of people develop among retirees and academics and uh, that you might call thought leaders. And uh, they not only take uh, personal satisfaction in expressing their views, but they also earn not inconsiderable amounts of money. And so you have the development of what you might call almost policy entrepreneurs in the Chinese system. And they may be uh, more or less, and often less, in sync with the central policy line. Particularly, it seems recently, uh, in the last few years, retired PLA officers, People's Liberation Army officers, seem to be speaking out, feeling relatively unconstrained. And yet, when I meet with People's Liberation Army officers that are active and uh, military leaders in China, they're often much more calibrated and much more balanced. Uh, you know, once you go out and you're trying to sell your ideas on the market, they tend to become more extreme. When you're in a position of responsibility and tugging and hauling in the bureaucracy and different interests, you tend to be more restrained. So what I see, and this is what you, you asked earlier, the role of public opinion is becoming greater in China. Public opinion being both what you might call citizens and retirees and so on. And you have a media that's hungry for controversy because increasingly they have to uh, attract advertising and be commercially viable themselves. So I think you're seeing not only a change in the selection process of Chinese leaders, but are encasing this new set of leaders is in fact a new Chinese society that's emerging. And frankly, I think over time what you're seeing is the evolution of, of what you might call weaker leaders, and I don't mean that as a personal comment about the uh, moral fiber of each individual, but their, their capacity to shape political reality of the leaders is diminishing and society is becoming more fragmented and groups have more resources to push their own views. So I think, you know, in a fundamental way, one of the questions really is, is China evolving in a way where its leaders can control 
what's going on. And I think in, in a sense of macro question, that's one of the most important we'll face in the years ahead. Yeah, I just want to add one thing that the, the, the growing influence of retired leaders is a very important phenomenon in China today. And uh, because uh, China ended the strongman politics you know, after Deng Xiaoping stepped down, this deliberate effort to make a collective leadership, uh, Hu Jintao and Wen Jiabao, just the, the first among the equals. Then if Jiang Zemin retire, then he may still have some influence, but has no real power. Real power go with the position. So that was a consensus during the past 10 years or so. But now you have the problem because there's a lot of criticism because of public opinion, because retired leaders' appearance in major events or publish their memoir. People is kind of nostalgic, you know, missing the, the old leaders. Now they become a force through their proteges and through their personal comments and or public appearance. Now, when Xi Jinping become the top leader, this is also unique that he will have two bosses, former leaders, behind the scene, not only one, not only Fu Jintao, but Zhang Zemin, despite that he is uh, you know, 86 years old, but still try to influence or shape China's political direction. So that's really confused the Chinese political process, make the policy making process lengthy, more complicated, sometimes deadlock. So that's a challenge China need to overcome. Just to give you an example, uh, the former premier under uh, Zhang Zemin, Zhu Rongji, just published his a collection of his speeches from the early 90s up to his retirement. And of course, many of these speeches concern policy directions. What struck me most is he, uh, it was published in the West, in the uh, in a high visibility uh, English language press. And concurrent with the release of the book, he released about a four minute uh, <laughs> videotape to go along in which he speaks to the audience in English and uh, describes uh, you know, the accomplishments that the book documents and makes it clear that nobody censored his book. Uh, and I thought it was, it was in a, a sense a kind of commentary on his successors, I interpreted it. Yeah. So you're finding uh, the, the retirees are not wallflowers. Well, this is again, it's a, I think unless until China really uh, find the institutional mean deal with this kind of uh, multi-dimensional, you know, shakers and movers to really to make sure that uh, the the real decision power lies in the current institution rather than from outsiders. This is a big challenge that China need to overcome. But uh, you can understand when Xi Jinping and Li Keqiang, both of these leaders are not really seriously tested. They are weak. I agree with uh, uh, Michael's characterization, relatively speaking, they are weak. Of course, they have tremendous opportunity to prove, but only a short period of time. In my view, they uh, will not give them another five years or another 10 years. They need to prove within a year or two, they are capable leaders. They provide a new vision, a new set of policy to make China move in the right direction, economically, socially, and politically, and also in the international arena, regain China's respect. Now this is a daunting challenge within a short period of time. But if you give the impression that it's another set of the, the same leaders who will talk a lot but do nothing, that will not resonate well in China. Okay. So um, I guess uh, the, the, the follow-up to that would be, are we expecting to see some major policy shifts with the transition? Is that, is, does that look likely at this point in time or are we expecting uh, especially in, in regards to Chinese policy towards the U.S. or mutual um, interactions, what, what are we seeing? Well, of course, to be determined, and part of how China's leaders, any leaders, will react depends on the environment they're facing. So if the world's in economic distress and that's spreading to China, we'll have one situation. If we don't have a global double, double dip and China's going ahead with 8% growth and the U.S.'s economy turned around, that'll be, be another. Uh, also, it'll depend what kind of environment, frankly, a U.S. policy creates. If uh, Chinese people and leaders perceive that we are trying to constrain them and uh, fence them in, they would say containment. 
uh, then they will react in one way if they think they have a chance to integrate into the regional and global economy and increasingly in security structures, then they'll behave differently. So we shouldn't make the mistake of thinking that the, uh, the volition of Chinese leaders is the only thing that will determine Chinese policy. Uh, and I think there are some worrisome trends in the external policy. But looking at these two leaders and the consensus in Chinese politics that I think they represent, in the end, what you've heard from uh, Chung Li and what I believe is Chinese leaders are most concerned about the domestic environment, the domestic growth, domestic equality. And frankly, I don't think ch these Chinese leaders or any Chinese leaders that are likely to emerge will want to take on the international community in a hostile way and divert themselves from the agenda that will in fact keep them in power, and that's China's domestic concern. So I would expect broad continuity uh, in terms of relations with the U.S., but there are some trends underway, both nationalism in China and, quite frankly, what Secretary Clinton calls our pivot to Asia, and you will see, uh, uh, you know, we're building up our uh, uh, military capacity in that area, shifting it from where it's less needed now to the Pacific area. This will be concerning to the Chinese, and this will energize Chinese nationalism. So I think what you're going to see in the future is a bit of a struggle internally within the minds of each Chinese leader, let alone between Chinese leaders. How much can we afford to continue to pay attention to our domestic concerns versus how much do we have to deal with this external environment that we're uncertain about? Okay. Well, well, we, we have a few minutes left. Uh, new leaders always means new policies. And uh, this is certainly, if you compare with Mao's generation to Deng's generation to Jiang Zemin's generation to Hu Jintao, Wen Jiabao's generation, you see drastic change, despite the fact that China still remains as a communist regime, a one-party rule. But policy dr changed dramatically from the, you know, the, the, the political emphasis to economic emphasis to from the coastal regional development, particularly Shanghai's rise, to more balanced uh, regional development, rise of the intern, uh, inland China. But I think that the new leaders will have the uh, new, a new agenda. They were concerned about the new legacy. But at the same time, they also need to react as uh, Michael just mentioned. That, uh, so it's a daunting challenge. The fundamentally, to see whether China make a real transition to rule of man, to rule of law, and the constitutional development. That's a very important development. I hope the next generation will realize their agenda, their mandate, to move in that direction, political reforms, and constitutionalism in China. Okay, well, that's all the time we have for today. That was very, very interesting. So I would like to thank you again, Dr. Lampton and Dr. Lee, for joining us on our program. Um, thank you to our audience at home for joining us today. We'll see you at the next China Forum. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs>